And so if you have your Bibles, please open up with me a familiar to us place of scripture that continues to contain the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, that is the unsearchable inheritance of Christ. This is Matthew 5, 45 and 48, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The sermon that I would like to continue is called Called to Perfection. We together know that this promise contained in the commandment is the inheritance of the saints of all generations and this commandment of Christ is addressed specifically to his students. Therefore, people who do not accept God's delegated authority over themselves have no part in the inheritance that is contained in this commandment and are not able to have it, don't have the right to be called students because they never come to church as students, they come as inspectors in order to inspect the one that is preaching, whether he speaks correctly or incorrectly. I remember in one of the churches I was in, I was preaching and after the church, a woman with a who an educated woman uh, she gave me a couple of uh, she gave me a piece of paper with a couple of words on it and uh, told me these few places you're you were incorrect and you didn't speak correctly and all the rest you were pretty good at or spoke correctly and I thought strange they don't look at the meaning of the uh, truth that's being spoken they're looking at the spelling of a word or a pronunciation of a word uh, the first disciples if you remember were actually this is uh, one of the things that uh, they were distinctive in that they uh, were fishermen and they weren't actually highly educated individuals uh, but spoke greatly and why did Jesus choose for himself these fishermen these men that uh, pretty much had a middle class uh, level say of uh, of education say does that mean he ignored education no of course not he was seeking people that when they hear his truth they without question will follow it whether they be with great uh, education or with a level of education or not God doesn't look at that he looks at how a person is going to receive the truth very few people with a high level of education receive the truth because their mind is God for them, they are not able to uh, remove this God and put another God above themselves. They attempt with their mind to search the scriptures and they condemn themselves to hell in this way because they place their mind equal to God's. I have my own head, this is how I understand it, and why do I need to listen to this man? I always was uh, confused by people's question, what kind of opinion do you have? A hundred people have different, a hundred different opinions. I'm not interested in the opinions of others. I ask them, uh, why do you not ask, how is it written, the truth? And they say, well, I don't understand or agree with this this way. And I say, why? Because I see it differently. Can you bring forth a place of scripture? I ask them. They don't base anything from scripture. They uh, look at their own opinions and base things off of their own opinions and such people of course cannot be called righteous they're those haters of Christ or antichrists and so relevant to fulfilling this required commandment we stop to study the purpose of the righteousness of God in the heart of a man specifically the goals that the righteousness of God abiding within our heart is called to pursue and in part we've been studying the purpose of the righteousness of God within our heart received by us in the two broken tablets of the covenant where we die by the law for the law to live for the one that died and resurrected by doing so receive confirmation of our salvation in the new tablets of the covenant in the format of the law of the spirit of life 
so that we provide God a basis to give us the promise to be heirs of peace, not by the past law, but by the righteousness of faith, like he gave it to Abraham and his descendants, his seed. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, Romans 4.13. We note that the righteousness of faith is determined by the obedience of our faith to the faith of God, which is presented in the preached word of God sent together with the person who represents a father to us from God. The faith of God is information that comes from above. This is not, these are not our emotions. This is information that comes from hearing the word of truth. Faith is from hearing the word of truth. Our faith is obedience to the words of God that come out of his mouth. Therefore, the promise of the peace of God is given only to those men that are obedient to the order of God in accordance to which God sends us his word by the mouth of his delegated ones. Obe obeying God's order is not trying to, with your mind, interpret the scriptures. This is dangerous. This is dangerous. Sometimes people come to me, and this, is, this has been in the past, uh, and even before I became a pastor of the church and before God placed this responsibility over me on me and they would say let's fantasize together what if it's like this or what if it's like this and I was always in shock when they asked me this and I say what am I offering fantasies to you and they said well no but if I explained a a certain truth and they liked it and they also wanted to participate in that and present a similar version of this and I told them you don't need to do this this is only in one way as God uh, would like it to be in no other way God has one th one truth not a lot of opinions all need to be obedient to the truth and forget about well I don't understand it that way or I have my own mind the covenant of peace within the heart of man is the result of the obedience of his faith to the faith of God, which is the spoken word of God's delegated ones. In a specific format, we've already looked at six signs by which we need to determine and examine ourselves as to whether we are the sons of peace as well as the sons of God and have been studying the seventh sign. And this is our ability to be clothed into the essence of the holy and selective love of God. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Colossians 3, 14, 15. So when we put on love, the love of God agape, then the peace of God rule, will rule in your heart. If we are clothed into God's love, then the scriptures command, this is a commandment, to be uh, thankful it, to, towards specific people you may not experience any sort of feeling uh, or compassion say or you may not sympathize with these people but still you need to demonstrate love in the human understanding is love is when I have an emotional attraction to this person of some kind or emotionally drawn to someone they somehow are attractive to me or to, according to my standards uh, but a person that's not attractive or uh, even bothersome and it truly is so because we all are different Just, uh, some people will be attractive to us others will not be and what do you do don't follow after your feelings and tell your feelings in the name of Jesus Christ I command you to love these people and when you command your feelings and you will be friendly with these people you'll be, begin to notice that they actually become very attractive to you as individuals as people loves God God's love is not emotions but fulfilling God's commandment if you love me keep my commandments 
I often say, as Apostle Peter attempted to prove to Jesus that he loved him, show, uh, indicating his emotions that, Lord, Jesus, you know that I love you. He was telling him, uh, in other words, look at my emotions. You see your God. You can see my feelings for you. You, with these feelings, also betrayed Christ. He had that feeling and he betrayed Christ. He was ready to die for Jesus, but in the needed moment when the powers of hell were before you and you and tested you, you said, I don't know this man. You were looking at the teacher that they're leading to his death and said, I don't know this man. You three times denied him. And Jesus at this time, in the third time when he denied him, I don't know this man, he said. He turned and so looked at him, and their eyes met, and the arrow pretty much went through Peter's heart because he loved him with his emotions. He left in shame, in fear. And suddenly, if you remember, he had met, Jesus had met him, this was after the uh, death. He asked him, he asked Peter, do you have any food? And they said no. And he didn't know yet, it was the teacher. But as soon as he discovered it, he told them, Jesus told him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me as you said you did? And he says, yes, you know that I love you. And he said, but if you love me, then tend my flocks. Why are you fishing? Did I not call you? I told you to leave this service, I'll make you fishers of men. Leave these nets, I will give you other nets. Why is it that you say, I love you, but you're fishing? And Peter, of course, didn't understand that in the moment. Jesus told him three times, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes. And thir the thir third time he asked him, do you love me? Jesus, uh, Peter became saddened. He says, Lord, you know that, you know everything. And he says, take care of my sheep. Until this time, Jesus said the words, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, but he didn't hear that. We are not to be led by our emotions, but lead our emotions. If our emotions don't experience God's presence, that doesn't mean that he's not close to you. Possibly he's closer to you than ever at that moment. Our emotions are very deceptive. Our emotions don't have a mind. They have, they have no mind. Why do you follow them? The mind of Christ, the information that comes from above, this is where this is, is should be your basis. This is where you are to look. If God told you who He is for you and what who you are for Him, base everything off of that and not what you're feeling. This is important. According to this place of scripture, and it's not the only one, the reign of the peace of God within our heart is possible only upon one condition, and that is, if the selective love of God, that's how I call it, I replace the word holy love with selective love. The reason for that is because holy, people don't understand what holy, holy love means. Holy is separating one from the other, the white from the black, the lawless from the righteous, the unclean from the pure one. The holy is separated, belonging to God, God's holiness. And so the other word, holy, is selective. It selects the one and he foreknew us before the creation of the world. He separated us. He chose us as holy because he knew we'd follow his way. If the selective love of God will abide within our heart and if we will be clothed into the selective love of God, then it will happen that will pr this will give God the basis to fill us with his peace since in the selective love of God which is the atmosphere of the peace of God
we see seven unearthly virtues, and these are virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 8, and you will not find, of course, these definitions in any dictionary. Yes, the dictionaries have these words, but they are not the definitions that the Holy Spirit intended or had or put into these words. Every uh, quality or all of these qualities of the fruits of virtue are in one the other, they flow one from the other, complete one the other, strengthen one the other, and confirm the truthful nature of one the other. Second, these qualities, these seven characteristics, are called to be the moral perfection within our heart and an example inherent to the essence of God himself. <clears throat> it turns out that these characteristics are the natural characteristics of our Heavenly Father. The given qualities are the great and precious promises entrusted to us through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. For the given qualities presented in the seven characteristics are the imperishable treasure and unsearchable wealth of Christ with which we need to become rich. The unsearchable means it is not possible to be counted and weighed. It is so great. You can weigh anything. You can weigh the earth, you can weigh us, but you can't weigh the riches, the rich love of Christ for us. Fifth, in order to receive the inheritance of these qualities, these seven unchanging characteristics, it is necessary for us to receive the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life, which is only possible when we will come out of spiritual infancy, leave this childhood, when we're grown into full measure of growth in Christ. Infants in Christ are not able to receive the Holy Spirit in their heart as the Lord and Master of their life. They're able to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they're not able to receive the Holy Spirit Himself as the Lord and Master of their life for the reason that they are attracted by different winds of teaching. The Holy Spirit cannot be a master in a person who is attracted by all forms of teaching. How can he lead a pastor or a person who in the internet is always looking uh, to steal from other preachers and then present it as their own? One of these pastors told me, yes, in the internet I find a lot of anointed men of God and I don't think that uh, as in the Proverbs it's written that I'm on the road and before it's, it, I'm not the one like the harlot that uh, casts her legs uh, for every man. Uh, in other words, he doesn't agree with the truth is what he said. God had said to Israel that you led yourself or behaved as one, as the harlot, that would offer herself to anyone who would pass by. That is the same kind of behavior. You may not consider it, but that's a, as a prostitute, a surprising prostitute. Prostitutes uh, receive money, but you're such a pro prostitute, God says, that pays money uh, to others so that they sleep with her, lay with her. In the modern language, a prostitute is... And you say, what, God called his nation this way? Yes, he did, because that's how they behaved. God, uh, saw that their behavior was like this. He told them, listen to the person, the one person that they need to listen to. But they refused to, and they behaved so as he said. You may hear, listen to other anointed people preachers as as you you would like but what is the church of christ this is an army an army has f different uh different uh positions different uh ranks 
you either are in aviation or you're uh, out on the sea or or you're a general, whatever you may be, each one has their own place. Yes, another person may be an anointed of God. Uh, if you're in one, uh, if you are in one position and you're trying to go and see what's in the others, uh, you are going to be out of your place. And so you being in your place, you fulfill your purpose and your unique calling. Pray where God wants to see you, in which place he would like to see you, what position he'd like to see you. Imagine if a simple soldier uh, in the army wants to uh, be a marine. Suddenly he gets this idea to be a marine. They're not going to put him on a boat and just let him go out. He, they're going to say you don't belong in this uh, to this place you, uh, you you need to go back to where you came from when God created an army uh, in Israel he created four armies having four as a four generals and each army had its own position its own place and so depending on the call each army knew when to co go out or what to do each one knew their own camp their own uh, banner they knew each one had their own individual banner also and the person needed to know their own banner it says that his banner is love but every single division every single place uh, had its own every single group every single army had their own purpose if God has appointed why I say this is because if God appointed one person for you that's where you can grow spiritually and finally come out of this infancy the spiritual infancy if you're looking uh, as Apostle Paul says in a mirror as through uh, fogged or faded glass and why is it that people go and listen to those preachers that uh, speak heresy, speak deception, speak the wrong things, because they are not grown and they do not listen to the one that God has sent them to listen to? Seventh, by inheriting these great and precious promises in the form of the fruit of our spirit, we become part of God's divine nature, which is why the confessions of the faith of our heart become equal in power to the words that come out of the mouth of God. The means that we are to utilize for receiving the power of the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of our life is the obedience of our faith to the faith of God. Since the selective love of God demonstrated in the seven unchanging qualities and characteristics have nothing in common with and cannot have anything in common with the nature of human love that is filled with egoism, greed, and is just temporary. It is the power of the selective love of God and the formant of seven qualities of unearthly virtue that is called to enthrone the resurrection of Christ in our earthly bodies and clothe our earthly body into the resurrection of Christ that is into our new person, the bond of perfection of the selective love of God is unconditional when it comes to the seven qualities of virtue. Unlike the tolerant and egotistical love of man, the unconditional nature of the selective love of God in the seven qualities of virtue is different in that it contains the burning jealousy of God all his knowledge and his absolute wisdom that in no way is able to be used for greedy and egotistical purposes and goals of a man. At the same time, the tolerant love of man toward other men is very conveniently used for greedy and egotistical purposes. Here's what the scriptures say regarding the strength of the love of God. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. 
if a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, when it says the floods will not drown it, that means the floods of uh, deceptive teaching. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Songs of Solomon 867. If preachers appear and begin to preach about materialistic prosperity, then you will deny them because you already have uh, the valuable and unsearchable treasure of Christ which is your wealth and you perfectly understand that the righteous they walk to and from wildernesses and they were in sheep's clothing or camel's clothing of camel's hair their clothing was made and they experienced insufficiency in, in in things sometimes they had a lack of, of clothing sometimes food water but when these emissaries of mammon say that if you don't have enough money that means you have the spirit of poverty and so they try to free the people from the spirit of poverty and they shout and they teach a strategy of how to do it everyone understands what the mind of a uh, man is and they say you need to meditate uh, and about two million that you will earn in the year and when you do this they say that you will open up the opportunity to yourself and these two million will appear possibly for some it will appear but it won't be from God for many it will not appear but for some it will to deceive the 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 rest one of these people that were in our church they became angry that I did not agree with this and they left the church I asked him if you put two million dollars but God wanted to give you ten million then you are not in accordance to God's will you're resisting God God wanted to give you 10 million you put in your mind 2 million or the opposite you put 2 and God wants you to earn $20,000 in the year just 20,000 but you're not in agreement with that you say how is it just 20,000 you do understand that God can uh, keep and provide for you with one dollar even those that will have billions will be hungry because his stomach will be hurting and he'll have the uh, some stomach sores or other issues with and his entire life will not be a joy or a pleasure to him they then grind everything do you know how Trump eats soup? They, uh, they, he likes it to be as in a puree form. I read this about how he liked it before he was a president, when he had his organization, when he had his own businesses, in order to select uh, beauty beauty queens. That was his business. And, and they were writing about what they what he was eating, and he sat down and was eating as a pureed uh, potato soup. Uh, and what does this mean? Uh, that there are sometimes situations where a person may be ill uh, in the stomach and of course and for example if he if someone is healthy and has a lot of money and eats well but look at the end of these of, of these people they often go to hell but teach others to become rich be afraid of those who teach you to become rich to earn money you don't need to learn how to make money or become rich if God called you to be rich you will be rich but if he did not call you to be rich learn as much as you'd like you won't be rich materialistically you won't we need to understand that the measure of the love of God is identified by and is known by the measure of God's hatred toward evil and men who do this evil and not the amount of money you may have in your wallet. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Hebrews 1.9 
Here it's talking about Christ, a person, all the gold and silver was in his hands at the time, but at times he was hungry and thirsty. He ate what he could and drank water where he could find it. He was thirsty and was hungry, and the disciples went to find food in the city. They were his cooks. Imagine what can these men prepare. They went to buy bread in the city. They ate bread and drank water. And there, if there was fish, then this was already uh, great. And so Jesus was hungry, and he was thirsty, and he was sitting at the well. He couldn't drink it himself because, from the well, because you needed to uh, let down your bucket. <coughs> and a woman comes, a Samaritan woman at this time, and gathers water for herself. At this time, uh, women did that work, and so Jesus turns to her and asks her for water to drink. She was surprised. She saw that he was not a Samaritan. He was he was in the clothing of a rabbi. And you, being a Jew, how is it that you're asking me for water? You Jews don't communicate with the Samaritan people. We want to communicate with you, but you don't want to communicate with us. You don't let us to worship in the Jerusalem temple. And so our fathers had to build a temple upon Mount Ger uh, Gerizim. And you say, give me drink. And he said, if you would have known the gift of God and who it is who's asking you, you yourself would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. And if you drank it, you would never, you would, you would never thirst again. And she said, Lord, she said, Adonai, because the, f the word Adonai is a person as well as God. It's just written a little bit different. Give me some of this water. She asked him, she saw in him something that she, did, she never saw in any other Jew. Tell me, how do you pray? On this mountain, or in the Jerusalem temple. She's, and he said, not in the Jerusalem temple and not on this mountain, for the Father is seeking those who, who would worship him in spirit and in truth. And she said, I know about this. She knew this prophecy. I know about this promise, I'm familiar with it, but I also know that this promise will uh, become real when the Messiah will come. The Samaritan people, they were waiting for the coming of the Messiah of Israel. They waited for him, that he will allow them to worship in the Jerusalem temple, and they knew about that. And then Jesus said, it's, this is I. She believed it very, very quickly. The Jews didn't believe this. They wanted to stone Jesus more than once. They became angry. They were looking how to kill him when he would tell them, but this Samaritan woman believed him. And she didn't give him drink but from joy she left her vessel she says wait I'm gonna come come back she went to her people and told them listen I have found the person that the Word of God wrote about the Messiah and they said are you old are you are you sure they weren't believing her at first but she said he said everything that I had done because he said call your husband and come back when he, and she admitted that she didn't have a husband and he said you're right 
that you don't have a husband. You've been married to five men, and the man that you live with now is not your husband. And, of course, she understood that before her, it wasn't just a simple Jew, but a prophet. And when the Samaritans came and saw this person, and he began to speak to them, you know what they said to this woman? We now see that this is the Messiah. We don't need you to tell us anymore. We see for ourselves that this is the truth. The Samaritans acknowledged him. The inheritance of God, the wealth of God is in knowing the Messiah, seeing that you have found him, that he is in your heart, and this is wealth that is un incomparable with any wealth of the world. And the Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves the righteousness, his countenance beholds the upright. Psalm 11, 5-7 God has loved righteousness in the carriers of righteousness and uh, hates, hates lawlessness in those who carry lawlessness. Only loving what God loves and hating what God hates, we are able to demonstrate God's perfection in his reaction toward the righteous who perform good and the unrighteous who perform lawlessness. The selective love of God by its unchanging nature in the format of seven supernatural qualities is called to grow us into the fullness of the growth of Christ or lead us into the perfection like the perfection of our Heavenly Father so that we can shine the light of our Son upon the just and the unjust and pour out our rains according to God's intentions upon the righteous for good and the unrighteous to punish them. Considering therefore that these seven qualities of virtue identifying the selective love of God do not have an analog in the earthly realm of the human lexicon not in any dictionary of the world. The love of God is the foundation and atmosphere of the moral and immovable law, opening up within our heart the essence of God and the essence of the heavenly kingdom. And this is not all. The love of God agape is a sovereign love which is unconditional when it comes to the people it chooses in its abilities to foreknow and predestine. For whom he foreknew, before the creation of the world, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8, 29. To foreknow is to know ahead of time. God has the ability to see ahead of time when the truth will be preached, the word of truth, how this person will behave, how he will receive this word. Will he receive it into a heart of stone or during and during any or the littlest of trials or tests he will wilt because he does not have good soil or he will receive it into a good soil, into a good heart that has no thorns because thorns we ourselves plant. Don't think that someone plants these thorns in our heart. The seed that falls into the thorn is choked. The kingdom of heaven is choked by the thorns, and it dies. And this is us who select or find these thorns. When the emissaries of mammon begin to preach what materialistic prosperity is, and that God wants us to be materialistically rich, God wants that we be rich in faith. That we be rich in faith. That is what God wants. That is what our wealth is. Because of its sovereignty, the selective love of God never violates the sovereign rights of those people she selects and never allows her own sovereign rights within her boundaries to be violated. These boundaries identified as his burning holiness. And so when he comes to a man, a person who has left spiritual infancy, he knocks into their heart. He'll never knock into a heart of an infant in Christ, a spiritual infant, because he, it's, it's not going to make any difference. He will not be able to determine the knock of the devil or knock of God. 
God does not enter by the door he or the devil doesn't enter by the door he enters by the window by the things we like we see with our eyes and go oh how I like this I also want it and so again he is a thief he doesn't uh, walk again through the door but through the window but God uses the door we had a pastor in Moscow he who asked me uh, brother uh, who uh, where are you from and I said I'm from Georgia and he says, oh, it's good that you're not from India. And I said, why? And he, it says, uh, because he says that uh, those from India are criminals and thieves. And I said, where did it, he get this kind of information? And apparently he misused the words and confused the words. Uh, uh, there are certain words that uh, that me meant window, but it was a different translation of it. He completely misunderstood it and uh believe these kinds of things uh, the people of uh, Moscow was another example that of people that uh, surprised me I would I thought that when I go there and these people from Moscow they'll be speaking uh, and pronouncing words correctly and in, in a higher level uh, and uh, ended up in a church and they actually spoke in a very very what would be called in a village type of uh, uh, vocabulary is what they used and so the, he was one of the gentlemen who was preaching uh, uh, he was reading the place where the tree was planted by the rivers of water uh, and also the other place where it was talking about the, as the deer uh, pants and uh, for the waters as it's written and he misunderstood these words and uh, so they misunderstood and misinterpreted the words and were believing that a deer coming panting for water he would use the vocab his vocabulary wasn't very good and uh, the words that he was misinterpreting he was demanding that people uh, receive as they were as even though they were inaccurate and a woman who attempted to correct that these words at one point was actually d uh, expelled from that church for 10 years and she believed this and couldn't repent she believed that she couldn't repent so these kinds of uh, unfortunate things happen sometimes in a specific format when we're studying God's holy burning love we have been studying or have studied it already in the qualities of virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance and stop to study the virtue of the love of God in the mystery of great godliness and without controversy great is the mystery of godliness God was manifested in the flesh justified in the spirit seen by angels preached among the Gentiles believed on in the world received up in glory 1 Timothy 3.16 therefore by demonstrating the signs of the fruits of godliness we identify the true quality of the love of God agape within our heart and within the heart of men whose words, actions, and the manner in which they dress are supposed to prompt the instincts of the opposite gender. It's not important what, uh, what the uh, fashion is in the moment because the way things are right now they just are undressing people more and more before uh, the devil would uh, undress people under uh, certain situations uh, due to heresy and other things but today people are more undressed and being in this kind of way these kinds of fashions coming to the church in this kinds of fashions they shouldn't feel comfortable before God dressing that way
And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. There is a great difference between and fundamental difference between the goodness of God and his favor toward man and the godliness of man, which he is called to demonstrate in his love to God. For example, the godliness of a man is his favor for God, a man's grace for God, and his thanksgiving for God. This is the ability of a man to visit the fatherless and the widow in their hardship and keep themselves from being defiled by the world. The godliness of a man is to imitate Christ and meditate about the things of the hills accept also and seek God in his good acceptable and perfect will the godliness of God is God's responsive reaction to the godliness of man this is his goodness toward man his favor and his grace toward man his mercifulness toward man his thanksgiving toward man as a response again to the thanksgiving a person gives him his good work and his good acts his kindness in the absolute sense of the word See toward whom is God's favor, toward those who are good to God. And so those who are not fa favoring God, not only is God not favorable toward them, but hates such a man. And so don't deceive yourself in saying that God loves everyone. God does not love everyone. He loves those who favor him or show their favor toward him. And to show his their favor, demonstrate their favor, is fulfilling his commandments. If you break God's commandments and say that you favor God, this is, some, this is a deception. You deceive yourself and those around you and bring forth God's wrath upon you as well. As well, the Old as well as the New Testament identified the virtue of the love of God in the discipline of godliness as one of the greatest mysteries of God himself, which defends and makes the sincere love of God impossible for counterfeit and falsification. Aside from these characteristics called to identify the character of godliness, there is also a counterfeit form of godliness that exists as well, that will conflict with and resist the true form of godliness, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. 2 Timothy 3, 5. If we, according to this place of scripture, don't break our relationship with people that have the look of godliness and will not distance ourselves from them, then they will corrupt our godliness that is contained in our good habits, which is why we together with them will inherit the prepared for them destruction. Relevant to this, we need to answer four classical questions. First, what are the characteristics of godliness of both God and man in Scripture? Second, what purpose does godliness have within the relationship of God with man and man with God? Third, what conditions do we need to fulfill to collaborate our godliness with the godliness of God? And fourth, by what signs do we need to determine that our godliness is truly collaborating with the godliness of God? In a specific format, as much as the Lord has allowed in the measure of our faith, we've already looked at the first three, question, uh, first three questions and have been studying one of the signs of the fourth question. The sign that we are collaborating our, our godliness with the goodness of God, we've been studying our ability to be the cloud of God filled with his moisture and scatter his light, that in turn is turned by his guidance for correction for his land or for mercy. Job 37, 11 through 16. Also with moisture, he saturates his thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds. In Matthew, we read that he sends his rain on the just and unjust. See how he sends these rains. He saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds. And they swirl about being turned by his guidance and that, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. He causes it to come whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. And so people uh, that don't understand the truth pull, uh, pull out this place of scripture and say, see, God sh uh, loves the righteous and unrighteous. They take the book of Matthew, but he sends his rain for the one for correction for his land or for mercy. Rains poured down as a favor toward the one and for the unrighteous as punishment, as a correction. Listen to this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. 
the form of perfection. These are my miraculous works, my wondrous works. Do you know when God dispatches them and causes the light of his cloud to shine? Do you know how the clouds are balanced, those wondrous works of him who is perfect in knowledge? <clears throat> Dispatching his clouds for correction or for his land or for mercy, according to his will, means to be a carrier of the favor and punishment of the one who is perfect in knowledge. This is one of the fundamental elements by which we need to examine ourselves as to whether we are collaborating our favor with the favor of God. Romans 11.22, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God, the two separate poles here, on those who fell severity, those who in the beginning came and then began to say, well, I don't agree with this, I don't understand it this way, God calls them as those who fell away and toward them his goodness is in his severity but toward you goodness if you continue in his goodness otherwise you also will be cut off leave your do not leave your church as some have the habit of doing it says in scripture those who leave their church they fall away from God's grace their church their church is the church where that God brought them that had a person that, that demonstrates his his, uh, his father as one who is sent by him as a father demonstrating God's goodness toward one and his severity toward the not, toward the, the other we become carriers of his justice within his holiness the phrase do you know when God dispatches as them and causes the light of his cloud to shine indicates the fact that not all clouds are able to be clouds that God dispatches and cause the light of a shine but only those clouds which provide God a basis so that they can contain his moisture in themselves this is confirmed by another place of scripture he binds up the water in his thick clouds yet the clouds are not broken under it he covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it Job 26 8 9 he has covered his throne with this cloud that has his moisture and to differentiate the clouds of the Most High in the form of the saints that fear God from profane to his nature clouds in the form of pseudo saints that do not have in themselves the fear of the Lord it is necessary for us to know that our ability to provide God the basis to fill us with his moisture and our readiness to scatter his light and direct it according to his guidance is our function by fulfilling this function we demonstrate our favor to God the function to fill us with moisture so that we can be led by the Holy Spirit and be turned by His guidance is God's favor, which is His response to our to Him favor, demonstrated in our readiness to be filled with His moisture, which indicates our hunger and thirst to listen to the preached word of truth and to examine ourselves as to whether we are truly in accordance to the demands of a cloud of God capable of collaborating our godliness with his godliness so that we can provide him legitimate grounds to fill us with his moisture the moisture of the Holy Spirit and be led by the Holy Spirit and be turned by his guidance we needed to answer a series of questions first how do we identify according to scripture the requirements necessary for us to be in accordance to the demands of the clouds of the most high filled with his moisture capable of scattering his light second what purpose do we fulfill as the clouds of the heavenly father that are filled with his moisture and scatter his light third what conditions do we need to fulfill so that God establishes us as his clouds and by what signs do we determine that we are truly the clouds of the Most High capable of being filled with His moisture? Answering the, the given question, we have noted that the essence of the given allegory contains the eternal goals of God demonstrated in His intentions. These intentions are our purpose and our calling, which consists of being perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, it is necessary to scatter your light from your cloud upon the just and unjust and pour out the receive from God moisture in the form of rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous. Second, we are called to release the moisture we have from the Heavenly Father in the form of rain and scatter His light according to His will and not according to our whims or conclusions. In the New Testament, the meaning consisting in the purpose of being a cloud of God is mechanically presented in the 
following words. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, Romans 8.14. Which means that if we are not in accordance to the requirements of a cloud of God capable of being filled with His moisture and scattering His light for the purpose of correcting one and demonstrating mercy upon another, then our sonhood needs to be seriously questioned. When it talks about clouds lacking moisture, we who are tossed to and fro by all kinds of deceptive teachings that are profane to God, we have... Uh, been studying the category of people located within the Church of, of Saints that do not have the Spirit of the Lord and resist the Spirit of the Lord because due to their carnal way demonstrate in their ignorance they, stum they stumble and are attracted by various winds of doctrine by the tricky or trickery of man and sly crafty deception we have been looking at the cloud of the most high as the category of saints that are led by the holy spirit by the means of their new person created in accordance to god in christ jesus in righteousness and holy truth and this means that the clouds of the most high can only be those saints that have grown into full measure of growth in christ and are in accordance to the demands of perfection that is inherent to god Further, we have noted that the clouds of the Most High are within, are those within God's possession and they are a symbol of His great mystery and are called to fulfill a vital role in the work of adopting and redeeming our body from the law of sin and death. Therefore, the cloud of the Most High in Scripture is a symbol of the glory of God, the place where God abides, the cloth into which God dresses, and the midst from which God or the Lord speaks. In a specific format, we've already looked at two questions and two of the conditions of the third question. Therefore, we'll immediately turn to study the third condition of the third question. Third, to be in accordance to the requirements of a cloud of, of God, it is necessary to pour your rains of righteousness upon our earth and command your earth to open and bring forth salvation and that righteousness spring up from our earth together with salvation. Rain, uh, rain down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Isaiah 45, 8. <coughs> In the given commandment, in order to be in accordance to the clouds of God, we see concealed conditions of collaborating or the collaboration of the seed of the preached to us word by that person that represents for us the power of a father from God in order to plant into our heart the seed of the word about salvation and righteousness in the format of the fruit of the tree of life. The phrase rain down you heavens from above means fill the clouds with moisture. This command is clearly addressed to those saints that carry responsibility for fulfilling clouds or filling the clouds with moisture and possess from God power to rain, which means speak the good word of truth in order to be filled with the moisture of God. The phrase, let the skies pour down righteousness, let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together, refers directly to that category of saints that accept over themselves the authority of God in the words of the person that is sent by God so that they can pour down right, uh, righteousness upon their earth and command their earth so that it, it open up and bring forth salvation and bring righteousness the phrase I the Lord have created it means that man that the man that possesses the power of a father from God has planted the seed of the word of righteousness a person gives the power to water and watered the seed of righteousness and God grew the seed of righteousness as it is written 1 Corinthians 3 5 through 11 who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believe as the Lord gave to each one I planted Apollos watered and God gave the increase so then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters but God who gives the increase now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which, he, which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 5-11 
Now, what conditions do we need to fulfill so that we, in the form of clouds of the Most High, could become able to be filled with His moisture, rain upon our earth so that it can bring us salvation and spring up righteousness? Rain down, you, O heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Isaiah 45, 8. Looking at this place of scripture addressed to us as clouds of the Most High, we can see two conditions. The first condition, to have the ability to be filled with the moisture of the preached word. It is necessary to be clothed into the mantle of a student of Christ, ready to be a- ready and able to pay the price for the offer to us truth in the preached word. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, yes, his own life also, and cannot he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So likewise, whoever of you do not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Luke 4. 1426-33. Second condition, it is necessary to rain righteousness first upon your own earth and command your earth so that it bring forth salvation and spring forth righteousness. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you will not take this word and not receive it by faith and confess it with your mouth as the faith of your heart, if you will not do this, nothing will happen. But if you confess with your mouth (coughs) the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, (coughs) then you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9, 10. (coughs) By your words you are justified, and by your word you are condemned. Fourth, to be in accordance to the requirements of a cloud of God, it is necessary to determine, by the wisdom that comes from above, the abilities of our faith, and humble ourselves in accordance to the demands of the will of God. Who can number the clouds by wisdom, or who can pour out the bottle of heaven when the dust hardens in clumps and the clouds cling together? uh, Job 38, 37, 38. Considering that what God wants to make happen on earth, he will make happen by the confessed word, which is the faith of God abiding within the heart of his people. The phrase number the clouds in Hebrew means to weigh and number your abilities by the measure of the faith that you have. The phrase, who can pour out the bottles of heaven, means to bend your vessel so that the one who is thirsty may drink. And so the original says that this is to actually bend your vessel with water so that you can give drink to the one that thirsts. And so the one that thirsts is the Holy Spirit, whose food is our humility before the will of God. That is written in the Holy Scriptures that is within our heart. Therefore, to bend your vessel is to humble yourself in accordance to to the demands of the will of God. And in this way, quench the hunger and thirst of the Holy Spirit. It's noteworthy that in Hebrew, the phrase, the vessels of heaven, means new wineskins or a new wine bag that is filled with new wine, indicating a person that is being filled with the Holy Spirit or that is led by the Holy Spirit. Second, vessel or pot, for pure beaten oil for the lamp indicates, here we're talking about the meaning of these, <clears throat> the meaning of this bottles of heaven. Second, vessels or pots for pure beaten oil for the lamp and it indicates a person who, in whose heart the wisdom of God in the form of the Urim and Thummim abides. And third, these bottles is a zinther, a triangular mus- musical instrument released or releasing low-pitched sounds and having around 12 strings played by stroking the chords with your fingers or a specific finger tool, which indicates that person that praises and glorifies God in accordance to the demands of the 12 stones of the breastplate of judgment that we see in the elementary principles of Jesus Christ. And so humbling ourselves in accordance to God's demands, we demonstrate God's faith in the new wineskins, in these new, in this new uh, wine, in the vessel with pure oil and the musical instrument with 12 strings. 
The phrase, when the dust hardens and clumps, that means that uh, the melted uh, metals are being poured out. The phrase where it says the clods cling together means that they come together as one whole because this earth means the church of Jesus Christ, not just the soil of our heart, but also the soil of the body of Christ altogether. And when the clods cling together, they cling one to the other, they stick one to the other and become one. And this can only happen when we will be as the grains that are ground and into fine flour. And until this happens, we still feel as if we're alone and will not actually feel like we're together. Only when God will allow this grain to be ground in His stones, then we will we be that uh, will be that flower then we will experience this uh, unity until we experience this unity we will not be able to experience the destruction of the stronghold of death in our body and erection of stronghold of life yes God has already started and has performed a great work he began to purge the church and as you see many people we did not uh, disqualify or ask to leave because they left themselves. The angels did the work to remove these weeds and he didn't of course cast them out randomly. They have been now bundled into their own sheaves and they feel themselves confident not knowing that they are the synagogue of Satan. They think now they will allow for themselves what they were not able to allow before. Now they are going to go to India, Mexico or wherever they want to go to preach Christ is what they think they'll be serving God because here they think that they couldn't do this and God now has bundled them together and, but the wheat gather into my barn into my storehouse and when they gather the wheat they uh, cast it on the winds with a winnowing fan and his winnowing uh, fan is in, in his hand and he will burn the chaff and separate the grain and if you one of you don't experience this unity with each other we're not yet flower but you if you've received the promise of God that belongs to the door of our hope that the stronghold of death be destroyed within our body here on earth the old person be thrusted out from within your body and the stronghold of life be built in its place then that grain that is placed into his treasury into his storehouse present yourself to God and allow the Holy Spirit together with you do this work the final step is where you're being ground it's not an easy process it's that process that we're talking about where we clothe ourselves into our new person and it happens by being ground little by little in the book of the Song of Solomon this is tearing off the skin of a living person or a living animal I've cast off my robe when the groom had knocked to her she cast off her robe so that she can be, you can be clothed into your new person you can take off the old one and put on the new and in the original it means to remove the skins of a living animal offer yourself a living sacrifice to God it's written but in order to present yourself you need to remove the skin generally from an animal the skin was removed when it was slaughtered it was removed but here al alive why does she say how can I I don't have another yet but I've removed already the one that I had but she needs to put on a new one but to put on a new one you need to remove the old so this removal happens by this grinding process and you will experience a final process the final this will be the final trials and you will and we together all of us because some of you may already experience yourself flower others as grains 
But the entire work will be done soon. And right now we're going to be praying so that we and we will ask the Lord that we he, we can present ourselves for God's work. Amen. Let us pray. All those who desire to destroy the dependence of sin that's in them, destroy the dependence of fear and shame you may be dependent upon. The Lord is here to help you to separate yourself from the shell, from the chaff, to become this pure grain, to be within his grinding stools. And he is here to support you. He's not against you. We wait for you here. I will be praying your prayer together with you and I ask you to deeply believe that God is for you. He's not against you. And he is vigilant over his word so that it b he can fulfill it for you. Close your eyes. This is your secret room. Lift your hands to God. A sign that you're ready to receive from God what he wants to and desires to give to you. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you. I open up my heart. I confess my sins before your face. I hate it. I love your righteousness. I ask you, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me. I love you. Deliver me from shame. I accept your word, the word of justification, into my heart. And right now, before heaven and hell, I want to proclaim that in accordance to your words, I am washed, I am cleansed, I am healed, I am restored, I am justified, and I am saved. Your sins are forgiven and your trespasses in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you. May he look upon you with his great face and show you mercy and give you peace. May thousands and ten thousands attempt to come near you, but they won't touch you. May all of the blessings of the ancient valleys and hills be on you. May the stronghold of death be removed from your body with noise and may the stronghold of life be erected in its place may all this be upon you and your children and be fulfilled upon you and the nation shall say amen Here's what we need to have in our image thinking, not earned millions, but waiting and presenting our body, our body to be freed from the most evil enemy, which is corruption and death. That's what you need to have in your mind. That's what you need to confess. And that's what you need to you're supposed to consider yourself dead to sin, living for God, which will give God the proper basis when the time comes that it is established by Him to do this work for you. And this is the great and unsearchable riches of Christ that you have received into your heart and may this be in you, may it grow into fullness. Let us proclaim our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.